Chapter forty three of Survivors of the Chancellor by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Owen's death, January eleventh to fourteenth. Owen's convulsions returned with increased violence, and in the course of the night he expired in terrible agony. His body was thrown overboard almost directly. It had decomposed so rapidly that the flesh had not even consistency enough for any fragments of it to be reserved for the boatswain to use to bait his lines. A plague the man had been to us in his life, in his death he was of no service. And now, perhaps still more than ever, did the horror of our situation stare us in the face. There was no doubt that the poisoned barrel had at some time or other contained copperas. But what strange fatality had converted it into the water cask, or what fatality stranger still had caused it to be brought on board the raft, was a problem that none could solve. Little, however, did it matter now. The fact was evident. The barrel was poisoned, and of water we had not a drop. One and all we fell into the gloomiest silence. We were too irritable to bear the sound of each other's voices, and it did not require a word, a mere look or gesture was enough, to provoke us to anger that was little short of madness. How it was that we did not all become raving maniacs, I cannot tell. Throughout the twelfth, no drain of moisture crossed our lips, and not a cloud arose to warrant the expectation of a passing shower. In the shade, if shade it might be called, the thermometer would have registered at least a hundred degrees, and perhaps considerably more. No change next day. The salt water began to chafe my legs, but although the smarting was at times severe, it was an inconvenience to which I gave little heed. Others who had suffered from the same trouble had become no worse. Oh, if this water that surrounds us could be reduced to vapor, or to ice, its particles of salt extracted, it would be available for drink. But no, we have no appliances, and we must suffer on. At the risk of being devoured by sharks, the boatswain and two sailors took a morning bath, and as their plunge seemed to refresh them, I and three of my companions resolved to follow their example. We had never learned to swim, and had to be fastened to the end of a rope and lowered into the water, while Curtis, during the half-hour of our bath, kept a sharp lookout to give warning of any danger from approaching sharks. No recommendation, however, on our part, nor any representation of the benefit we felt we had derived, would induce Miss Hervey to allay her sufferings in the same way. At about eleven o'clock, the captain came up to see me and whispered in my ear, "'Don't say a word, Mr. Caslon. I do not want to raise false hopes, but I think I see a ship. It was as well that the captain had warned me, otherwise I should have raised an involuntary shout of joy. As it was, I had the greatest difficulty in restraining my expressions of delight. Look behind the larboard, he continued in an undertone. Affecting an indifference, which I was far from feeling, I cast an anxious glance to that quarter of the horizon of which he spoke, and there, although mine was not a nautical eye, I could plainly distinguish the outline of a ship under sail. Almost at the same moment, the boatswain, who happened to be looking in the same direction, raised the cry, Ship ahoy! Whether it was that no one believed it, or whether all energies were exhausted, certain it is that the announcement produced none of the effects that might have been expected. Not a soul exhibited the slightest emotion, and it was only when the boatswain had several times sung out his tidings that all eyes turned to the horizon. There, most undeniably, was the ship. But the question arose at once to the minds of all, and to the lips of many. Would she see us? The sailors immediately began discussing the build of the vessel, and made all sorts of conjectures as to the direction she was taking. Curtis was far more deliberate in his judgment. After examining her attentively for some time, he said, She is a brig running close upon the wind, on the starboard tack. If she keeps her course for a couple of hours, she will come right athwart our tracks. A couple of hours? The words sounded to our ears like a couple of centuries. The ship might change her course at any moment. Closely trimmed as she was, it was very probable that she was only tacking about to catch the wind. In which case, as soon as she felt the breeze, she would resume her larboard tack and make away again. On the other hand, if she was really sailing with the wind, she would come nearer to us and there would be a good ground for hope. Meantime, no exertion must be spared, and no means left untried to make our position known. The brig was about twelve miles to the east of us, so that it was out of the question to think of any cries of ours being overheard. But Curtis gave directions that every possible signal should be made. We had no firearms by which we could attract attention, 
and nothing else occurred to us beyond hoisting a flag of distress miss herbey's red shawl as being of a color most distinguishable against the background of sea and sky was run up to the masthead and was caught by the light breeze that just then was ruffling the surface of the water as a drowning man clutches at a straw so our hearts bounded with hope every time that our poor flag fluttered in the wind for an hour our feelings alternated between hope and despair the ship was evidently making her way in the direction of the raft but every now and then she seemed to stop and then our hearts would almost stand still with agony lest she was going to put about she carried all her canvas even to her royals and staysails but her hull was only partially visible above the horizon how slowly she advanced the breeze was very very feeble and perhaps soon it would drop altogether we felt that we would give years of our life to know the result of the coming hour at half past twelve the captain and the boatswain considered that the brig was about nine miles away she had therefore gained only three miles in an hour and a half and it was doubtful whether the light breeze that had been passing over our heads had reached her at all i fancied too that her sails were no longer filled but were hanging loose against her masts turning to the direction of the wind i tried to make out some chance of a rising breeze but no the waves were calm and torpid and the little puff of air that aroused our hopes had died away across the sea i stood aft with monsieur letourneur andre and miss herbey and our glances perpetually wandered from the distant ship to our captain's face curtis stood leaning against the mast with the boatswain by his side their eyes seemed never for a moment to cease to watch the brig but their countenances clearly expressed the varying emotions that passed through their minds not a word was uttered nor was the silence broken until the carpenter exclaimed in accents of despair she's putting about all started up some to their knees others to their feet the boatswain dropped a frightful oath the ship was still nine miles away and at such a distance it was impossible for our signal to be seen our tiny raft a mere speck upon the waters would be lost in the intense irradiation of the sunbeams if only we could be seen no doubt all would be well no captain would have the barbarous inhumanity to leave us to our fate but there had been no chance only too well we knew that we had not been within range of sight my friends said curtis we must make a fire it is our last and only chance some planks were quickly loosened and thrown into a heap upon the fore part of the raft they were damp and troublesome to light but the very dampness made the smoke more dense and ere long a tall column of dusky fumes was rising straight upwards in the air if the darkness should come on before the brig was completely out of view the flames we hoped might still be visible but the hours passed on the fire died out and yet no signs of help the temper of resignation now deserted me entirely faith hope confidence all vanished from my mind and like the boatswain i swore long and loudly a gentle hand was laid upon my arm and turning around i saw miss herbey with her finger pointed to the sky i could stand it no longer but gliding underneath the tent i hid my face in my hands and wept aloud meanwhile the brig had altered her track and was moving slowly to the east three hours later and the keenest eye could not have discerned her topsails above the horizon end of chapter forty three chapter forty four of survivors of the chancellor by jules verne this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by joe denoya somerset new jersey the depths of despair january fifteenth after this further shattering of our excited hopes death alone now stares us in the face slow and lingering as that death may be sooner or later it must inevitably come to-day some clouds that rose in the west have brought us a few puffs of wind and in spite of our prostration we appreciate the moderation slight as it is in the temperature to my parched throat the air seems a little less trying but it is now seven days since the boatswain took his haul of fish and during that period we had eaten nothing even andre letourneur finished yesterday the last morsel of the biscuit which his sorrowful and self-denying father had entrusted to my charge jinkstrop the negro has broken loose from his confinement but curtis has taken no measures for putting him again under restraint it is not to be apprehended that the miserable fellow and his accomplices weakened as they are by their protracted fast will attempt to do us any mischief now some huge sharks made their appearance today, cleaving the water rapidly with their great black fins. The monsters came up close to the edge of the raft, 
and Flaypole, who was leaning over, narrowly escaped having his arm snapped off by one of them. I could not help regarding them as living sepulchres, which ere long might swallow up our miserable carcasses, yet withal I professed that my feelings were those of fascination rather than horror. The boatswain, who stood with clenched teeth and dilated eye, regarded these sharks from quite another point of view. He thought about devouring the sharks, not about the sharks devouring him, and if he could succeed in catching one, I doubt if one of us would reject the tough and untempting flesh. He determined to make an attempt, and as he had no whirl which he could fasten to his rope, he set to work to find something that might serve as a substitute. Curtis and Dallas were consulted, and after a short conversation, during which they kept throwing bits of rope and spars into the water in order to entice the sharks to remain by the raft, Dallas went and fetched his carpenter's tools, which is at once a hatchet and a hammer. Of this he proposed to make the whirl of which they were in need, under the hope that either the sharp edge of the adze or the pointed extremity opposite would stick firmly into the jaws of any shark that might swallow it. The wooden handle of the hammer was secured to the rope, which, in its turn, was tightly fastened to the raft. With eager, almost breathless, excitement, we stood watching the preparations, at the same time using every means in our power to attract the attention of the sharks. As soon as the whirl was ready, the boatswain began to think about bait, and, talking rapidly to himself, ransacked every corner of the raft as though he expected to find some dead body coming opportunely to sight. But his search ended in nothing and the only plan that suggested itself was again to have recourse to Miss Hervey's red shawl, of which a fragment was wrapped around the head of the hammer. After testing the strength of his line, and reassuring himself that it was fastened firmly both to the hammer and to the raft, the boatswain lowered it into the water. The sea was quite transparent, and any object was clearly visible to a depth of two hundred feet below the surface. Leaning over the low parapet of the raft, we looked on in breathless silence as the scarlet rag, distinct as it was against the blue mass of water, made its slow descent. But one by one the sharks seemed to disappear. They could not, however, have gone far away, and it was not likely that anything in the shape of bait dropped near them would long escape their keen voracity. Suddenly, without speaking, the boatswain raised his hand and pointed to a dark mass skimming along the surface of the water and making straight in our direction. It was a shark, certainly not less than twelve feet long, as soon as the creature was about four fathoms from the raft, the boatswain gently drew in his line until the whirl was in such a position that the shark must cross right over it. At the same time he shook the line a little, that he might give the whirl the appearance, if he could, of being something alive and moving. As the creature came near, my heart beat violently. I could see its eyes flashing above the waves, and its gaping jaws, as it turned half over on its back, exhibited long rows of pointed teeth. I know not who it was, but someone at that moment uttered an involuntary cry of horror. The shark came to a standstill, turned about, and escaped quite out of sight. The boatswain was pale with anger. The first man who speaks, he said, I will kill him on the spot. Again he applied himself to his task. The wall was again lowered, this time to the depth of twenty fathoms, but for half an hour or more not a shark could be distinguished. But as the waters far below seemed somehow to be troubled, I could not help believing that some of the brutes, at least, were still there. All at once, with a violent jerk, the cord was wrested from the boatswain's hands. Firmly attached, however, as it was to the raft, it was not lost. The bait had been seized by a shark, and the iron had made good its hold upon the creature's flesh. Now then, lads, cried the boatswain, haul away! Passengers and sailors, one and all, put forth what strength they had to drag the rope but so violent were the creature's struggles that it required all our efforts, and it is needless to say that they were willing enough to bring it to the surface. At length, after exertions that almost exhausted us, the water became agitated by the violent flappings of the tail and fins, and looking down I saw the huge carcass of the shark writhing convulsively amid waves that were stained with blood. "'Steady, steady,' said the boatswain, as the head appeared above. The whirl had passed right through the jaw into the middle of the throat, so that no struggle on the part of the animal could possibly release it. Dallas seized the hatchet, ready to dispatch the brute the moment it should be landed on the raft. A short, sharp snap was heard. The shark had closed its jaws and bitten through the wooden handle of the hammer. Another moment it had turned round and was completely gone. 
a howl of despair burst from all our lips all the labor and the patience all had been in vain dowlas made a few more unsuccessful attempts but as the whirl was lost and they had no means of replacing it there was no further room for hope they did indeed lower some cords twisted into running knots but as might have been expected these only slipped over without holding the slimy bodies of the sharks as a last resource the boatswain allowed his naked leg to hang over the side of the raft the monsters however were proof even against this attraction reduced once again to a gloomy despondency all turned to their places to await the end that cannot now be long deferred just as i moved away i heard the boatswain say to curtis captain shall we draw lots the captain made no reply end of chapter forty four Chapter forty five of Survivors of the Chancellor by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Our thirst relieved. January sixteenth. If the crew of any passing vessel had caught sight of us as we lay still and inanimate upon our sailcloth, they would scarcely, at first sight, have hesitated to pronounce us dead. My sufferings were terrible. Tongue, lips and throat were so parched and swollen that if food had been at hand i question whether i could have swallowed it so exasperated were the feelings of us all however that we glanced at each other with looks as savage as though we were about to slaughter and without delay eat up one another the heat was aggravating by the atmosphere being somewhat stormy heavy vapors gathered on the horizon and there was a look as if it were raining all around longing eyes and gaping mouths turned involuntarily toward the clouds and m the turner on bended knee was raising his hands as it might be in supplication to the relentless skies it was eleven o'clock in the morning i listened for distant rumblings which might announce an approaching storm but although the vapors had obstructed the sun's rays they no longer presented the appearance of being charged with electricity thus our prognostications ended in disappointment the clouds which in the early morning had been marked by the distinctness of their outline had melted one into another and assumed a uniform dull gray tint in fact we were enveloped in an ordinary fog but was it not still possible that this fog might turn to rain happily this hope was destined to be realized for in a very short time dallas with a shout of delight declared that rain was actually coming and sure enough not half a mile from the raft the dark parallel streaks against the sky testified that there at least rain was falling i fancy i could see the drops rebounding from the surface of the water the wind was fresh and bringing the cloud right on toward us yet we could not suppress our trepidation lest it should exhaust itself before it reached us but no very soon large heavy drops began to fall and the storm cloud passing over our heads was outpouring its contents upon us the shower however was very transient already a bright streak of light along the horizon marked the limit of the cloud and warned us that we must be quick to make the most of what we had given us curtis had placed the broken barrel in the position that was most exposed and every sail was spread out to the fullest extent our dimensions would allow we all laid ourselves down flat upon our backs and kept our mouths wide open the rain splashed into my face wetted my lips and trickled down my throat never can i describe the ecstasy with which i imbibed that renovating moisture the parched and swollen glands relaxed i breathed afresh and my whole being seemed revived with a strange and requickened life the rain lasted about twenty minutes when the cloud only half exhausted passed quite away from over us we grasped each other's hands as we rose from the platform on which we had been lying and mutual congratulations mingled with gratitude poured forth from our long silent lips hope however evanescent it might be for the moment had returned and we yielded to the expectation that ere long other and more abundant clouds might come and replenish our store the next consideration was how to preserve and economize what little had been collected by the barrel or imbibed by the outspread sails it was found that only a few pints of rainwater had fallen into the barrel to this small quantity the sailors were about to add what they could by wringing out the saturated sails when curtis made them desist from their intention stop stop he said we must wait a moment we must see whether this water from the sails is drinkable i looked at him in amazement 
why would not this be as drinkable as the other he squeezed a few drops out of one of the folds of the sail into a tin pot and put it into his lips to my surprise he rejected it immediately and upon tasting it for myself i found it not merely brackish but briny as the sea itself the fact was that the canvas had been so long exposed to the action of the waves that it had become thoroughly impregnated by salt which of course was taken up again by the water that fell upon it disappointed we were but with several pints of water in our possession we were not only contented for the present but sanguine in our prospect for the future end of chapter forty five Chapter forty six of Survivors of the Chancellor by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Joe DeNoya, Somerset, New Jersey. My fast is broken. January seventeenth. As a natural consequence of the alleviation of our thirst, the pangs of hunger returned more violently than ever. Although we had no bait, and even if we had, we could not use it for want of a whirl we could not help asking whether no possible means could be devised for securing one out of the many sharks that were still perpetually swarming about the raft armed with knives like the indians in the pearl fisheries was it not practicable to attack the monsters in their own element curtis expressed his willingness personally to make the attempt but so numerous were the sharks that we would not for one moment hear of his risking his life in a venture of which the danger was as great as the success was doubtful by plunging into the sea, or by gnawing at a piece of metal, we could always, or at least often, do something that cheated us into believing that we were mitigating the pains of thirst, but with hunger it was different. The prospect, too, of rain seemed hopeful, while of getting food there appeared no chance, and as we knew that nothing could compensate for the lack of nutritive matter, we were soon all cast down again. Shocking to confess, it would be untrue to deny that we surveyed each other with the eye of an eager lion, and I need hardly explain to what a degree of savageness the one idea that haunted us had reduced our feelings. Ever since the storm cloud brought us the too transient shower, the sky has been tolerably clear, and although at that time the wind had slightly freshened, it has since dropped, and the sail hangs idly against our mast except for the trifling relief it brings by modifying the temperature we care little now for any breeze ignorant as we are as to what quarter of the atlantic we have been carried by the currents it matters very little to us from what direction the wind may blow if only it will bring in rain or dew the moisture of which we are so dreadfully in need my brain is haunted by the most horrible nightmares not that i suppose i am any way more distressed than my companions who are lying in their usual places, vainly endeavoring to forget their sufferings in sleep. After a time I fell into a restless, dreamy doze. I was neither asleep nor awake. How long I remained in that state of stupor I could hardly say, but at length a strange sensation brought me to myself. Was I dreaming, or was there not really some unaccustomed odor floating in the air? My nostrils became distended, and I could scarcely suppress a cry of astonishment but some instinct kept me quiet, and I laid myself down again with the puzzled sensation sometimes experienced when we have forgotten a word or name. Only a few minutes, however, had elapsed before another still more savory puff induced me to take several long inhalations. Suddenly the truth seemed to flash across my mind. Surely, I muttered to myself, this must be cooked meat that I can smell. Again and again I sniffed, and became more convinced than ever that my senses were not deceiving me. But from what part of the raft could the smell proceed? I rose to my knees, and having satisfied myself that the odor came from the front, I crept stealthily as a cat under the sail and between the spars in that direction. Following the promptings of my scent, rather than my vision, like a bloodhound in track of his prey, I searched everywhere I could, now finding, now losing, the smell according to my change of position, or the dropping of the wind. At length I got the true scent once for all so that i could go straight to the object for which i was in search approaching the starboard angle of the raft i came to the conclusion that the smell that had thus keenly excited my cravings was the smell of smoked bacon the membranes of my tongue almost bristled with the intenseness of my longing crawling along a little further under a thick roll of sailcloth i was not long in securing my prize forcing my arm below the roll i felt my hand in contact with something wrapped up in paper I clutched it up and carried it off to a place where I could examine it by the help of the light of the moon that had now made its appearance above the horizon. I almost shrieked for joy, 
It was a piece of bacon. True, it did not weigh many ounces, but small as it was, it would suffice to alleviate the pangs of hunger, for one day at least. I was just on the point of raising it to my mouth when a hand was laid upon my arm. It was only by a most determined effort that I kept myself from screaming out. One instant more, and I found myself face to face with Hobart. In a moment I understood all. Plainly, this rascal Hobart had saved some provisions from the wreck, upon which he had been subsisting ever since. The steward had provided for himself, while all around him were dying of starvation. Detestable wretch! This accounts for the inconsistency of his well-to-do looks and his pitiable groans. Vile hypocrite! Yet why, it struck me, should I complain? Was not I reaping the benefit of that secret store that he, for himself, had saved? But Hobart had no idea of allowing me the peaceable possession of what he held to be his own. He made a dash at the fragment of bacon, and seemed determined to wrest it from my grasp. We struggled with each other, and although our wrestling was very violent, it was very noiseless. We were both of us aware that it was absolutely necessary that not one of those on board should know anything at all about the prize for which we were contending. Nor was my own determination lessened by hearing him groan out that it was his last, his only morsel. His, I thought, it shall be mine now. And still careful that no noise of commotion should arise, I threw him on his back, and grasping his throat so that he gurgled again, I held him down until, in rapid mouthfuls, I had swallowed the last scrap of the food for which we had fought so hard. I released my prisoner, and quietly crept back to my own quarters, and not a soul is aware that I have broken my fast. End of chapter 46「forty seven of Survivors of the Chancellor by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Hobart hangs himself. January eighteenth. After this excitement, I awaited the approach of day with a strange anxiety. My conscience told me that Hobart had the right to denounce me in the presence of all my fellow passengers, yet my alarm was vain. The idea of my proceedings being exposed by him was quite absurd. In a moment he would himself be murdered without pity by the crew, if it should be revealed that, unknown to them, he had been living on some private store which, by clandestine cunning, he had reserved. But in spite of my anxiety, I had a longing for day to come. The bit of food that I had thus stolen was very small, but small as it was it had alleviated my hunger, and I was now tortured with remorse, because I had not shared the meagre morsel with my fellow sufferers. Miss Herby, Andre, his father, all had been forgotten, and from the bottom of my heart I repented of my cruel selfishness. Meantime the moon rose high in the heavens, and the first streaks of dawn appeared. There is no twilight in these low latitudes, and the full daylight came well nigh at once. I had not closed my eyes since my encounter with the steward, and ever since the first blush of day I had labored under the impression that I could see some unusual dark mass halfway up the mast. But although it again and again caught my eye, it hardly roused my curiosity, and I did not rise from the bundle of sails on which I was lying to ascertain what it really was. But no sooner did the rays of the sun fall upon it than I saw at once that it was the body of a man, attached to a rope, and swinging to and fro with the motion of the raft. A horrible presentiment carried me to the foot of the mast, and, just as I had guessed, Hobart had hanged himself. I could not for a moment doubt that it was I myself that had impelled him to the suicide. A cry of horror had scarcely escaped my lips, when my fellow passengers were at my side, and the rope was cut. Then came the sailors. And what was it that made the group gather so eagerly round the body? Was it a humane desire to see whether any spark of life remained? No, indeed. The corpse was cold, and the limbs were rigid. There was no chance that animation should be restored. What then was it that kept them lingering so close around? It was only too apparent what they were about to do. But I did not, could not, look. I refused to take part in the horrible repast that was proposed. Neither would Miss Herbie, Andre, nor his father consent to alleviate their pangs of hunger by such revolting means. I know nothing for certain as to what Curtis did, and I did not venture to inquire, but of the others, Falston, Dallas, the boatswain, and all the rest, I know that, to assuage their cravings, they consented to reduce themselves to the level of beasts of prey. They were transformed from human beings into ravenous brutes. The four of us who sickened at the idea of partaking of the horrible meal withdrew to the seclusion of our tent. 
it was bad enough to hear without witnessing the appalling operation but in truth i had the greatest difficulty in the world in preventing andre from rushing out upon the cannibals and snatching the odious food from their clutches i represented to him the hopelessness of his attempt and tried to reconcile him by telling him that if they liked the food they had a right to it hobart had not been murdered he had died by his own hand and after all as the boatswain had once remarked to me it was better to eat a dead man than a live one do what i would however i could not quiet andre's feeling of abhorrence in his disgust and loathing he seemed for the time to have quite forgotten his own sufferings meanwhile there is no concealing the truth that we were ourselves dying of starvation while our eight companions would probably by their loathsome diet escape that frightful destiny owing to this secret hoard of provisions hobart had been by far the strongest among us he had been supported so that no organic disease had affected his tissues and really might be said to be in good health when his chagrin drove him to his desperate suicide but what was i thinking of whither were my meditations carrying me away was it not coming to pass that the cannibals were rousing my envy instead of exciting my horror very shortly after this i heard dowlas talking about the possibility of obtaining salt by evaporating sea-water in the sun and then he said we can salt down the rest the boatswain assented to what the carpenter had said and probably the suggestion was adopted silence the most profound now reigns upon the raft i presume that nearly all have gone to sleep one thing i do know that they are no longer hungry end of chapter forty seven Chapter forty eight of Survivors of the Chancellor by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe DeNoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Hobart's body stolen. January nineteenth. All through the day the sky remained unclouded and the heat intense, and night came on without bringing much sensible moderation in the temperature. I was unable to get any sleep, and, toward morning, was disturbed by hearing an angry clamor going on outside the tent. It aroused Monsieur Letourneur, André, and Miss Herbie as much as myself, and we were anxious to ascertain the cause of the tumult. The boatswain, Dallas, and all the sailors were storming at each other in a frightful rage, and Curtis, who had come forward from the stern, was endeavoring to pacify them. "'But who has done it? We must know who has done it,' said Dallas, scowling with vindictive passion on the group around him. "'There's a thief,' howled out the boatswain, "'and he shall be found. Let's know who has taken it.' i haven't taken it nor i nor i cried the sailors one after another and then they set to work again to ransack every quarter of the raft they rolled every spar aside they overturned everything on board and only grew more and more incensed with anger as their search proved fruitless can you tell us said the boatswain coming up to me who was the thief thief i replied i don't know what you mean and while we were speaking the others all came up together and told me that they had looked everywhere else and that they were going now to search the tent shame i said you ought to allow those whom you know to be dying of hunger at least to die in peace there is not one of us who has left the tent all night why suspect us now just look here mr caslon said the boatswain in a voice which he was endeavoring to calm down into moderation we are not accusing you of anything we know well enough you and all the rest of you had a right to your shares as much as anybody but that isn't it it's all gone somewhere every bit yes said sandin gruffly it's all gone somewheres and we're going to search the tent resistance was useless and miss herbie monsieur letourneur and andre were all turned out i confess i was very fearful i had a strong suspicion that for the sake of his son for whom he was ready to venture anything monsieur letourneur had committed the theft in that case i knew that nothing would have prevented the infuriated men from tearing the devoted father to pieces I beckoned to Curtis for protection, and he came and stood beside me. He said nothing, but waited with his hands in his pockets, and I think I am not mistaken in my belief that there was some sort of weapon in each. To my great relief, the search was ineffectual. There was no doubt that the carcass of the suicide had been thrown overboard, and the rage of the disappointed cannibals knew no bounds. Yet who had ventured to do the deed? I looked at Monsieur Letourneur and Miss Herbie but their countenances at once betrayed their ignorance. Andre turned his face away, and his eyes did not meet my own. Probably it is he, but, if it be, 
I wonder whether he had reckoned up the consequences of so rash an act. End of chapter 48《Chapter Forty Nine of Survivors of the Chancellor by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. The Negro Becomes Insane, January Twentieth to Twenty Second. For the day or two after the horrible repast of the eighteenth, those who had partaken of it appeared to suffer comparatively little either from hunger or thirst. But for the four of us who had tasted nothing, the agony of suffering grew more and more intense. It was enough to make us repine over the loss of the provision that had so mysteriously gone. And if any one of us should die, I doubt whether the survivors would a second time resist the temptation to assuage their pangs by tasting human flesh. Before long, all the cravings of hunger began to return to the sailors, and I can see their eyes greedily glancing upon us, starved as they knew us to be, as though they were reckoning our hours, and already were preparing to consume us as their prey. As is always the case with shipwrecked men, we were tormented by thirst far more than were hunger, and if, in the height of our sufferings, we had been offered our choice between a few drops of water and a few crumbs of biscuit, I do not doubt that we should, without exception, have preferred to take the water. And what a mockery to our condition did it seem that all this, while there was water, water, nothing but water, everywhere around us. Again and again, incapable of comprehending how powerless it was to relieve me, I put a few drops within my lips, but only with the invariable result of bringing on a most trying nausea, and rendering my thirst more unendurable than before. Forty-two days had passed since we quitted the sinking Chancellor. There could be no hope now. All of us must die, and by the most deplorable of deaths. I was quite conscious that a mist was gathering over my brain. I felt my senses sinking into a condition of torpor. I made an effort, but all in vain, to master the delirium that I was aware was taking possession of my reason. It is out of my power to decide for how long I lost my consciousness, but when I came to myself I found that Miss Herbey had folded some wet bandages around my forehead. I am somewhat better, but I am weakened, mind and body, and I am conscious that I have not long to live. A frightful fatality occurred today. The scene was terrible. Jinkstrop, the negro, went raving mad. Curtis and several of the men tried their utmost to control him, but in spite of everything he broke loose, and tore up and down the raft, uttering fearful yells. He had gained possession of a handspike, and rushed upon us all with the ferocity of an infuriated tiger. How we contrived to escape mischief from his attacks, I know not. All at once, by one of those unaccountable impulses of madness, his rage turned against himself. With his teeth and nails he gnawed and tore away at his own flesh, dashing the blood into our faces. He shrieked out with a demonic grin, Drink! Drink! And flinging us gory morsels, kept saying, Eat! Eat! In the midst of his insane shrieks he made a sudden pause, then, dashing back again from the stern to the front, he made a bound and disappeared beneath the waves. Falston, Dowless, and the boatswain made a rush that at least they might secure the body, but it was too late. All they could see was a crimson circle in the water, and some huge sharks disporting themselves around the spot. End of chapter 49 Chapter 50 of Survivors of the Chancellor by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. All Hope Gone, January 23rd. Only eleven of us now remain, and the probability is very great that every day must now carry off at least its one victim, and perhaps more. The end of the tragedy is rapidly approaching, and save for the chance which is next to an impossibility of our sighting land, or being picked up by a passing vessel, ere another week has elapsed and not a single survivor of the Chancellor will remain. The wind freshened considerably in the night, and it is now blowing pretty briskly from the northeast. It has filled our sail, and the white foam in our wake is an indication that we are making some progress. The captain reckons that we must be advancing at the rate of about three miles an hour. Curtis and Falston are certainly in the best condition among us and in spite of their extreme emaciation they bear up wonderfully under the protracted hardships we have all endured words cannot describe the melancholy state to which poor miss hervey bodily is reduced 
her whole being seems absorbed into her soul and that soul is brave and resolute as ever living in heaven rather than on earth the boatswain strong energetic man that he was has shrunk into a mere shadow of his former self and i doubt whether anyone would recognize him to be the same man he keeps perpetually to one corner of the raft his head dropped upon his chest and his long bony hands lying upon knees that project sharply from his worn-out trousers unlike miss herbey his spirit seems to have sunk into apathy and it is at times difficult to believe that he is living at all so motionless and statue-like does he sit silence continues to reign upon the raft not a sound not even a groan escapes our lips we do not exchange ten words in the course of the day and the few syllables that our parched tongues and swollen lips can produce are almost unintelligible wasted and bloodless we are no longer human beings we are specters end of chapter fifty chapter fifty one of survivors of the chancellor by jules verne this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by joe denoya somerset new jersey flaypole becomes delirious january twenty fourth i have inquired more than once of curtis if he has the faintest idea to what quarter of the atlantic we have drifted and each time he has been unable to give me a decided answer though from his general observation of the direction of the wind and currents he imagines that we have been carried westward that is to say toward the land Today the breeze has dropped entirely but the heavy swell is still upon the sea and is an unquestionable sign that a tempest has been raging at no great distance the raft labors hard against the waves and curtis falston and the boatswain employ the little energy that remains to them in strengthening the joints why do they give themselves such trouble why not let the few frail planks part asunder and allow the ocean to terminate our miserable existence certain it seems that our suffering must have reached their utmost limit and nothing could exceed the torture that we are enduring the sky pours down upon us a heat like that of molten lead and the sweat that saturates the tattered clothes that hang about our bodies goes far to aggravate the agonies of our thirst no words of mine can describe this dire distress these sufferings are beyond human estimate even bathing the only means of refreshment that we possessed has now become impossible for ever since jinkstrop's death the sharks have hung about the raft in shoals today i tried to gain a few drops of fresh water by evaporation but even with the exercise of the greatest patience it was with the utmost difficulty that i obtained enough to moisten a little scrap of linen and the only kettle that we had was so old and battered that it would not bear the fire so that i was obliged to give up the attempt in despair falston is now almost exhausted and if he survives us at all it can only be by a few days whenever i raised my head i always failed to see him and he was probably lying sheltered somewhere beneath the sails curtis was the only man who remained on his feet but with indomitable pluck he continued to stand on the front of the raft waiting watching hoping to look at him with his unflagging energy almost tempted me to imagine that he did well to hope but i dared not entertain one sanguine thought and there i lay waiting nay longing for death how many hours passed away thus i cannot tell but after a time a loud peal of laughter burst upon my ear someone else then was going mad i thought but the idea did not rouse me in the least the laughter was repeated with greater vehemence but i never raised my head presently i caught a few incoherent words fields fields gardens and trees look there's an inn under the trees quick quick brandy gin water a guinea a drop i'll pay for it i've lots of money lots lots poor deluded wretch i thought again the wealth of a nation cannot buy a drop of water here there was silence for a minute when all of a sudden i heard the shout of land land the words acted upon me like an electric shock and with a frantic effort i started to my feet no land indeed was visible but flaypole laughing singing and gesticulating was raging up and down the raft sight taste and hearing all were gone but the cerebral derangement supplied their place and in imagination the maniac was conversing with absent friends inviting them into the george inn at cardiff offering them gin whiskey and above all water 
stumbling at every step and singing in a cracked discordant voice he staggered about among us like an intoxicated man with the loss of his senses all his sufferings had vanished and his thirst was appeased it was hard not to wish to be a partaker of his hallucination dowlas falston and the boatswain seemed to think that the unfortunate wretch would like jinkstrop put an end to himself by leaping into the sea but determined this time to preserve the body that it might serve a better purpose than merely feeding the sharks they rose and followed the bad man everywhere he went keeping a strict eye upon his every movement but the matter did not end as they expected as though he were really intoxicated by the stimulants of which he had been raving flaypole at last sunk down in a heap in a corner of the raft where he lay lost in a heavy slumber End of chapter 51《Chapter Fifty Two of Survivors of the Chancellor by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. I decide to commit suicide. January twenty fifth. Last night was very misty, and for some unaccountable reason, one of the hottest that could be imagined. The atmosphere was really so stifling that it seemed as if it only required a spark to set it alight. The raft was not only quite stationary but did not even rise and fall with any motion of the waves. During the night I tried to count how many there were now on board, but I was utterly unable to collect my ideas sufficiently to make the enumeration. Sometimes I counted ten, sometimes twelve, and although I knew that eleven, since Jinkstrop was dead, was the correct number, I could never bring my reckoning right. Of one thing I felt quite sure, and that was that the number would very soon be ten. I was convinced that I could myself last but very little longer. All the events and associations of my life passed rapidly through my brain. My country, my friends, and my family all appeared as it were in a vision, and seemed as though they had come to bid me a last farewell. Toward morning I woke from my sleep, if the languid stupor into which I had fallen was worthy of that name. One fixed idea had taken possession of my brain. I would put an end to myself and I felt a sort of pleasure as I gloated over the power that I had to terminate my sufferings. I told Curtis with the utmost composure of my intention, and he received the intelligence as calmly as it was delivered. Of course you will do as you please, he said. For my own part, I shall not abandon my post. It is my duty to remain here, and unless death comes to carry me away, I shall stay where I am to the very last. The dull gray fog still hung heavily over the ocean, but the sun was evidently shining above the mist and would, in course of time, dispel the vapor. Toward seven o'clock I fancied I heard the cries of birds above my head. The sound was repeated three times, and I went up to the captain to ask him about it. I heard him mutter to himself, Birds! Why, that looks as if land were not far off. But although Curtis might still cling to the hope of reaching land, I knew not what it was to have one sanguine thought. For me there was neither continent nor island. The world was one fluid sphere uniform monotonous as in the most primitive period of its formation nevertheless it must be owned that it was with a certain amount of impatience that i awaited the rising of the mist for i was anxious to shake off the phantom fallacies that curtis's words had suggested to my mind not till eleven o'clock did the fog begin to break and as it rolled in heavy folds along the surface of the water i could every now and then catch glimpses of clear blue sky beyond fierce sunbeams pierced the cloud rifts scorching and burning our bodies like red-hot iron but it was only above our heads that there was any sunlight to condense the vapor the horizon was still quite invisible there was no wind and for half an hour longer the fog hung heavily round the raft while curtis leaning against the side strove to penetrate the obscurity at length the sun burst forth in full power and sweeping the surface of the ocean dispelled the fog and left the horizon open to our eyes there exactly as we had seen it for the last six weeks was the circle that bounded sea and sky unbroken definite distinct as ever curtis gazed with intensest scrutiny but did not speak a word i pitied him sincerely for he alone of us all felt that he had the right to put an end to his misery for myself i had fully determined that if i lived till the following day i would die by my own hand whether my companions were still alive i hardly cared to know it seemed as though days had passed since I had seen them. Night drew on, but I could not sleep for a moment. Toward two o'clock in the morning my thirst was so intense that I was unable to suppress loud cries of agony. 
Was there nothing that would serve to quench the fire that was burning within me? What if, instead of drinking the blood of others, I were to drink my own? It would be all unavailing, I was well aware, but scarcely had the thought crossed my mind than I proceeded to put it into execution. I unclasped my knife, and stripping my arm with a steady thrust I opened a small vein. The blood oozed out slowly, drop by drop, and as I eagerly swallowed the source of my very life, I felt that for a moment my torments were relieved. But only for a moment. All energy had failed my pulses, and almost immediately the blood had ceased to flow. How long it seemed before the morning dawned, and when that morning came it brought another fog, heavy as before, that again shut out the horizon. The fog was hot as the burning steam that issues from a boiler. It was to be my last day upon earth, and I felt that I should like to press the hand of a friend before I died. Curtis was standing near, and crawling up to him I took his hand in my own. He seemed to know that I was taking my farewell, and with one last lingering hope he endeavored to restrain me. But all in vain, my mind was finally made up. I should have liked to speak once again to Monsieur Le Turner, Andre, and Miss Herbie, but my courage failed me. I knew that the young girl would read my resolution in my eyes, and that she would speak to me of duty, and of God, and of eternity, and I dared not meet her gaze, and I would not run the risk of being persuaded to wait until a lingering death should overtake me. I returned to the back of the raft, and after making several efforts I managed to get onto my feet. I cast one long look at the pitiless ocean and the unbroken horizon. If the sail or the outline of a coast had broken on my view, I believe that I should only have deemed myself the victim of an illusion but nothing of the kind appeared, and the sea was dreary as a desert. It was ten o'clock in the morning, the pangs of hunger and the torments of thirst were racking me with redoubled vigor. All instinct of self-preservation had left me, and I felt that the hour had come when I must cease to suffer. Just as I was on the point of casting myself headlong into the sea, a voice, which I recognized as Dallas's, broke upon my ear. Captain, he said, we are going to draw lots. Involuntarily I paused. I did not take my plunge, but returned to my place upon the raft. End of chapter 52、Chapter、53 of of Survivors of the Chancellor by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. We decide to draw lots. January 26th. All heard and understood the proposition. In fact, it had been in contemplation for several days, but no one had ventured to put the idea into words. However, it was done now. Lots were to be drawn, and to each would be assigned his share of the body of the one ordained by fate to be the victim. For my own part, I profess that I was quite resigned for the lot to fall upon myself. I thought I heard Andre Le Turner beg for an exception to be made in favor of Miss Herbie, but the sailors raised a murmur of dissent. As there were eleven of us on board, there were ten chances to one in each person's favor, a proportion which would be diminished if Miss Herbie were excluded, so that the young lady was forced to take her chance among the rest. It was then half past ten, and the boatswain, who had been roused from his lethargy by what the carpenter had said, insisted that the drawing should take place immediately. There was no reason for delaying the fatal lottery. There was not one of us that clung in the least to life, and we knew that, at the worst, Whoever should be doomed to die would only precede the rest by a few days, or even hours. All that we desired was just once to slake our raging thirst and moderate our gnawing hunger. How all the names found their way to the bottom of a hat I cannot tell. Very likely Falston wrote them upon a leaf torn from his memorandum book. But be that as it may, the eleven names were there, and it was unanimously agreed that the last name drawn should be the victim. But who would draw the names? There was hesitation for a moment, then, I will, said a voice behind me. Turning round, I beheld M. Le Turner standing with outstretched hand, and with his long white hair falling over his thin livid face that was almost sublime in its calmness. I divined at once the reason for this voluntary offer. I knew that it was the father's devotion and self-sacrifice that led him to undertake the office. As soon as you please, said the boatswain. M. Le Turner proceeded to draw out the folded strips of paper one by one, and after reading aloud the name upon it, handed it to its owner. The first name called was that of Burke, who uttered a cry of delight, then followed Flaypole and the boatswain. What his name really was I never could exactly learn. Then came Falston, Curtis, Sandon. More than half had now been called, and my name had not yet been drawn. 
I calculated my remaining chance. It was still four to one in my favor. M. Letourneur continued his painful task. Since Burke's first exclamation of joy, not a sound had escaped our lips, but all were listening in breathless silence. The seventh name was Miss Herbey's, but the young girl heard it without a start. Then came mine, yes, mine, and the ninth was that of Letourneur. Which one? asked the boatswain. Andre, said M. Letourneur. With one cry, Andre fell back senseless. Only two names now remained in the hat, those of Dallas and M. Letourneur himself. Go on, almost roared the carpenter, surveying his partner in peril as though he could devour him. M. Letourneur almost had a smile upon his lips, as he drew forth the last paper but one, and with a firm, unfaltering voice, marvelous for his age, unfolded it slowly and read the name of Dallas. The carpenter gave a yell of relief as he heard the word. M. Letourneur took the last bit of paper from the hat, and without looking at it, tore it to pieces. But unperceived by all but myself, one little fragment flew into the corner of the raft. I crawled toward it and picked it up. On one side of it was written, Andre. The rest of the word was torn away. M. Letourneur saw what I had done, and rushing toward me, snatched the paper from my hands and flung it into the sea. End of chapter 53《ハッピーバーティー》Chapter Fifty Four of Survivors of the by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe DeNoia, Somerset, New Jersey. Miss Herbey pleads for one more day, January twenty-sixth. I understood it all. The devoted father, having nothing more to give, had given his life for his son. Monsieur Letourneur was no longer a human being in the eyes of the famished creatures who were now yearning to see him sacrificed to their cravings. At the very sight of the victim thus provided, all the tortures of hunger returned with redoubled violence. With lips distended and teeth displayed, they waited like a herd of carnivora until they could attack their prey with brutal voracity. It seemed almost doubtful whether they would not fall upon him while still alive. It seemed impossible that any appeal to their humanity could, at such a moment, have any weight. Nevertheless, the appeal was made, and, as incredible as it may seem, prevailed. Just as the boatswain was about to act the part of butcher, and Dallas stood, hatchet in hand, ready to complete the barbarous work, Miss Herbey advanced, or rather crawled, towards them. My friends, she pleaded, will you not wait just one more day? If no lander ship is in sight tomorrow, then I suppose our poor companion must become your victim. But allow him one more day, in the name of mercy, I entreat, I implore you. My heart bounded as she made her pitiful appeal. It seemed to me as though the noble girl had spoken with an inspiration on her lips, and I fancied that, perhaps, in supernatural vision, she had viewed the coast or the ship of which she spoke, and one more day was not much to us who had already suffered so long and endured so much. Curtis and Falston agreed with me, and we all united to support Miss Herbey's merciful petition. The sailors did not utter a murmur, and the boatswain in a smothered voice says, Very well, we will wait till daybreak tomorrow, and threw down his hatchet. Tomorrow, then, unless land or a sail appear, the horrible sacrifice will be accomplished. Stifling their sufferings for a strenuous effort, all returned to their places. The sailors crouched beneath the sails, caring nothing about scanning the ocean. Food was in store for them tomorrow, and that was enough for them. As soon as Andre Letourneur came to his senses, his first thought was for his father, and I saw him count the passengers on the raft. He looked puzzled. When he lost consciousness, there had been only two names left in the hat, those of his father and the carpenter. And yet M. Letourneur and Dallas were both there still. Miss Herbey went up to him and told him quietly that the drawing of the lots had not yet been finished. Andre asked no further question, but took his father's hand. M. Letourneur's countenance was calm and serene. He seemed to be conscious of nothing except that the life of his son was spared, and as the two sat conversing in an undertone at the back of the raft, their whole existence seemed bound up in each other. Meantime, I could not disabuse my mind of the impression caused by Miss Herbey's intervention. Something told me that help was near at hand, and that we were approaching the termination of our suspense and misery. The chimeras that were floating through my brain resolved themselves into realities, so that nothing appeared to me more certain that either land or sail, be they miles away, would be discovered somewhere to leeward. I imparted my convictions to Monsieur Letourneur and his son. 
Andre was as sanguine as myself. Poor boy! He little thinks what a loss there is in store for him tomorrow. His father listened gravely to all we said, and whatever he might think in his own mind, he did not give us any discouragement. Heaven, he said, he was sure would still spare the survivors of the Chancellor, and then he lavished on his son caresses which he deemed to be his last. Some time afterward, when I was alone with him, M. Letourneur whispered in my ear, Mr. Caslon, I commend my boy to your care, and mark you, you must never know. His voice was choked with tears, and he could not finish his sentence. But I was full of hope, and, without a moment's intermission, I kept my eyes fixed upon the unbroken horizon. Curtis, Miss Herbey, Falston, and even the boatswain were also eagerly scanning the broad expanse of the sea. Night has come on, but I still have a profound conviction that through the darkness some ship will approach, and that at daybreak our raft will be observed. End of chapter 54「fifty five of Survivors of the Chancellor by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Fresh Water, January 27th. I did not close my eyes all night, and was keenly alive to the faintest sounds, and every ripple of the water, and every murmur of the waves broke distinctly on my ear. One thing I noticed and accepted as a happy omen, not a single shark now lingered round the raft. The waning moon rose at a quarter to one, and through the feeble glimmer which she cast across the ocean, many and many a time I fancied I caught sight of the longed-for sail lying only a few cable lengths away. But when morning came, the sun rose once again upon a desert ocean, and my hopes began to fade. Neither ship nor shore had appeared, and as the shocking hour of execution drew near, my dreams of deliverance melted away. I shuddered in my very soul as I was brought face to face with the stern reality. I dared not look upon the victim, and whenever his eyes, so full of calmness and resignation, met my own, I turned away my head. I felt choked with horror, and my brain reeled as though I were intoxicated. It was now six o'clock, and all hope had vanished from my breast. My heart beat rapidly, and a cold sweat of agony broke out all over me. Curtis and the boatswain stood by the mast attentively scanning the horizon. The boatswain's countenance was terrible to look upon. One could see that although he would not forestall the hour, he was determined not to wait a moment after it arrived. As for the captain, it was impossible to tell what really passed within his mind. His face was livid, and his whole existence seemed concentrated in the exercise of his power of vision. The sailors were crawling about the platform, with their eyes gleaming like the wild beasts ready to pounce upon their devoted prey. I could no longer keep my place, and glided along to the front of the raft. The boatswain was still standing intent on his watch, but all of a sudden, in a voice that made me start, he shouted, Now then, time's up, and followed by Dallas, Burke, Flaypole, and Sandin, ran to the back of the raft. As Dallas seized the hatchet convulsively, Miss Herbey could not suppress a cry of terror. Andre started to his feet. What are you going to do to my father? he asked in accents choked with emotion. My boy, said the measure of the turner, the lot has fallen upon me, and I must die. Never, shrieked Andre, throwing his arms around his father. They shall kill me first. It was I who threw Hobart's body into the sea, and it is I who ought to die. But the words of the unhappy youth had no other effect than to increase the fury of the men who were so staunchly bent upon their bloody purpose. Come, come, no more fuss, said Dallas, as he tore the young man away from his father's embrace. Andre fell upon his back in which position two of the sailors held him down so tightly that he could not move, while Burke and Sandin carried off their victim to the front. All this had taken place much more rapidly than I have been able to describe it. I was transfixed with horror, and much as I wished to throw myself between Monsieur Letourneur and his executioners, I seemed to be rooted to the spot where I was standing. Meantime, the sailors had been taking off some of Monsieur Letourneur's clothes, and his neck and shoulders were already bare. Stop a moment he said, in a tone which was the ring of indomitable courage. Stop. I don't want to deprive you of your ration, but I suppose you will not require to eat the whole of me today. The sailors, taken aback by his suggestion, stared at him with amazement. There are ten of you. My two arms will give you each a meal. Cut them off for today, and tomorrow you shall have the rest of me. Agreed, cried Dallas, and as Monsieur Turner held out his bare arms, 
Quick as lightning, the carpenter raised his hatchet. Curtis and I could bear this scene no longer. While we were alive to prevent it, this butchery should not be permitted, and we rushed forward simultaneously to snatch the victim from his murderers. A furious struggle ensued, and in the midst of the melee I was seized by one of the sailors and hurled violently into the sea. Closing my lips, I tried to die of suffocation in the water, but in spite of myself my mouth opened and a few drops trickled my throat. Merciful heaven! The water was fresh! End of chapter 55「fifty six of Survivors of the Chancellor by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Near the coast of South America, January 27th. Continued. A change came over me as if by miracle. No longer had I any wish to die, and already Curtis, who had heard my cries, was throwing me a rope. I seized it eagerly and was hauled up onto the raft. Fresh water were the first words I uttered. Fresh water, cried Curtis. Why, then, my friends, we are not far from land. It was not too late. The blow had not been struck, and so the victim had not yet fallen. Curtis and Andre, who had regained his liberty, had fought with the cannibals, and it was just as they were yielding to overpowering numbers that my voice had made itself heard. The struggle came to an end. As soon as the words fresh water had escaped my lips, I leaned over to the side of the raft and swallowed the life-giving liquid in greedy draughts. Miss Hervey was the first to follow my example, but soon Curtis, Falston, and all the rest were on their knees and drinking eagerly. The rough sailors seemed, as if by a magic touch, transformed back from ravenous beasts to human beings, and I saw several of them raise their hands to heaven in silent gratitude. Andre and his father were the last to drink. "'But where are we?' I asked at length. "'The land is there,' said Curtis, pointing to the west. We all stared at the captain as though he were mocking us. No land was in sight, and the raft, just as ever, was the center of a watery waste. Yet our senses had not deceived us. The water we had been drinking was perfectly fresh. "'Yes,' repeated the captain, "'land is certainly there, not more than twenty miles to leeward.' "'What land?' inquired the boatswain. South America, answered Curtis, and near the Amazon, no other river has a current strong enough to freshen the ocean twenty miles from shore. End of chapter 56 Chapter 57 of Survivors of the Chancellor by Jules Verne This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Land Ahoy! January 27th, continued. Curtis, no doubt, was right. The discharge from the mouth of the Amazon is enormously large, but we had probably drifted into the only spot in the Atlantic where we could find fresh water so far from land. Yet land undoubtedly there was, and the breeze was carrying us onward slowly but surely to our deliverance. Miss Herbie's voice was heard pouring out fervent praise to heaven, and we were all glad to unite our thanksgivings with her. Then the whole of us, with the exception of Andre and his father, who remained by themselves together at the stern, clustered in a group and kept our expecting gaze upon the horizon. We had not long to wait. Before an hour had passed, Curtis leaped in ecstasy and raised the joyous shouts of, Land ahoy! My journal has come to a close. I have only to relate, as briefly as possible, the circumstances that finally brought us to our destination. A few hours after we first sighted land, the raft was off Cape Magoria, on the island of Marajo, and was observed by some fishermen, who, with kind-hearted alacrity, picked us up and tended us most carefully. They conveyed us to Para, where we became the object of unbound sympathy. The raft was brought to land in latitude zero degrees, twelve minutes north, so that since we abandoned the Chancellor, we had drifted at least fifteen degrees to the southwest. Except for the influence of the Gulf Stream, we must have been carried far, far to the south, and in that case we should never have reached the mouth of the Amazon, and must inevitably have been lost. Of the thirty-two souls, nine passenger and twenty-three seamen, who left Charleston on board the ship, only five passengers and six seamen remained. Eleven of us alone survived. An official account of our rescue was drawn up by the Brazilian authorities. Those who signed were Miss Herbie, J. R. Casalon, M. Letourneur, Andre Letourneur, Mr. Falston, the boatswain, Dallas, Burke, Flaypole, Sandin, and last, though not least, 
Robert Curtis, Captain. At Para we soon found facilities for continuing our homeward route. A vessel took us to Cayenne, where we secured a passage on board one of the steamers of the French transatlantic Aspinwall line, the Ville de Saint Nazaire, which conveyed us to Europe. After all the dangers and privations which we have undergone together, it is scarcely necessary to say that there has arisen between the surviving passengers of the Chancellor a bond of friendship too indissoluble, I believe, for either time or circumstance to destroy. Curtis must ever remain the honored and valued friend of those whose welfare he consulted so faithfully in their misfortunes. His conduct was beyond all praise. When we were fairly on our homeward way, Miss Hervey, by chance, intimated to us her intention of retiring from the world and devoting the remainder of her life to the care of the sick and suffering then why not come and look after my son said monsieur letourneur adding he is an invalid and he requires as he deserves the best of nursing miss herby after some deliberation consented to become a member of their family and finds in monsieur letourneur a father and in andre a brother a brother i say but may we not hope that she may be united by a dearer and a closer tie, and that the noble-hearted girl may experience the happiness that she so richly deserves. End of chapter 57 End of Survivors of the Chancellor by Jules Verne